Okay, so is there anybody hearing me now? Could I show anything in the screen at all? Okay, that's great. So I have some responses now. So, well, guys, firstly, this is Abdullah Mansour. I work as a general clinical fellow. Okay, that's great. Now people can hear me. I work as a general clinical fellow at King's College and his trust. And I also work in Blackverse. I'll be talking to you today about uh, one of the high yield topics that usually come in PLAT exam. Okay. So everybody can see the screen, is that correct? Okay, good. So, good, that's great. So today we're going to talk about one of the high yield topics that usually come in PLAT exam. And uh, this topic is talking about the traumatic print injury. But before that, I need to give you some like information about uh, like uh, the Platverse Academy, okay? Platverse Academy, the academy that was established a, few, a year ago, and it it like uh, chair some notes with people that focus on high yield topics and Plab One exam that usually come Plab One exam. Uh, the organizer decided to start a new course, and it's a full course that focuses solely in Plab One topics. And the study material will be included in that. If you have been, if you have seen any of the study materials of the Plabverse before, we're going to be talking. Okay, somebody's saying he can't hear anything. Is this problem with everybody? Who's going to write anything if you can't hear me? Okay, that's great. So, guys, we're talking about today the Blackverse Academy. So, Blackverse Academy is an academy that was established a year ago, and we decided to start a new course about Blab One, and you will have this uh, all the, 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 the package in this design, which includes, firstly, a full course and all chapters in Platverse notes will be covered. And then this course is six weeks. You have two sh two sessions a week that that are guided by uh, uh, two of uh, the GMC registered doctors who will be talking to you about these topics. And each session will be like four or five hours. Okay. This course is 100% online. And if you if you uh, opted for the course, you will have all the notes included in your course. And at the end of this course, we'll have a mock exam. And this mock exam will be exactly like the PLAB1 exam, 180 MCQs that you have to solve in three hours. And then you will have to correct for yourself and we're gonna send you some feedback about that. Also, we'll have some interactive discussions during the course and we'll provide you with a study plans and a, a, a WhatsApp group. The WhatsApp group, just to discuss the topics that might be challenging to all of you. Okay, so guys, I just need you. If anybody have any question at any moment, just to write in the question part so I can read it and give you a feedback. Or if you can't hear me, just write anything in the question part. So I need to uh, improve uh, this webinar. Okay, so today we are talking about one of the high yield topics in Plab One exam, which is the traumatic brain injury. Okay, so what is traumatic brain injury? or the brain injury in general. Firstly, I need to divide this into two parts, okay? The uh, brain itself is, is, is the brain or the head itself is formed from the skull from outside and covered by the scalp and the skin and the muscle tissue. And from inside you have the brain, okay? The brain is basically formed of, I'm sorry, can see you talking but can't hear anything. And I'm missing out, Rebecca's seeing that. Okay, so are you using any headphones, Rebecca, or something like this? I'm not sure if the problem is with my PC or this is a general problem. Okay, that's great. So again, 
uh, we're talking about the traumatic brain injury. The head trauma includes the skull from outside and the brain from inside. This skull is exactly like a box, and this box have inside different tissues. And these tissues are the brain tissue itself, and the blood vessels, and the nerves, and the CSF. Okay? So if you have, if you induce any kind of trauma to your head, the skull might be injured or lead to a fracture in your skull. The brain tissue might be injured, leading to intraparenchymal hemorrhage, for example, or the blood vessels might be injured, or the nerves, or might the circulation of the CSF might be interrupted. So any, anything in the brain basically could be injured at any moment if you induced any kind of trauma at all. Okay? So traumatic brain injury, it includes the skull fractures or brain hematoma. Okay? And the skull fractures might be in the vault of the skull or the base of the skull. Okay? And the fractures itself might be linear or depressed or comminuted fracture. And this topic does not usually come in flap one exam. This is a very specialized topic. So our interest today will be the brain injury itself, the injury from inside or, or the structure that surrounds the brain. Okay? The brain injury is divided into two basic things, the primary brain injury and secondary brain injury. So what is primary brain injury? Primary brain injury, usually the injuries that already happened in the brain after inducing the trauma. Okay? So this injury usually irreversible. So for example, if you had a hammer and like knocked a head, this will lead to a trauma in the brain. This trauma or an injury inside the brain. This injury will be significantly irreversible. You cannot revert this anymore. So, but your job as a doctor is to prevent what is called by secondary brain injury, which is the injury that happened as a sequel or a complication from the primary pathology that happened already during the brain trauma. Okay? So the secondary brain injury might be due to hypoxia or diminished blood supply or increasing compression by a mass effect or anything that happened during the primary brain injury. Okay? Also, the injury we might classify in a different way called traumatic and spontaneous brain injury. Traumatic, which is obviously due to a trauma. It might be extradural epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hematoma, or intraparenchymal hematoma. We're going to talk about this in a bit more detail, and this is our basic topic today, but just to give you a general idea. Also, it might be spontaneous. Sometimes you will have a patient who is significantly old, like 75 years old, presented to you with a with disturbed conscious liver, for example, and you ask for a trauma reason because you're suspecting this. You cannot find any trauma uh, like clue at all. But the patient still has something inside his brain, maybe very big hemorrhage inside his brain. But this happens spontaneously. But the patient has some risk factors that can lead to this, like hypercholesterolemia and hypertension, for example, or bleeding disorder inside the brain or a tumor inside the brain. Anything like that can, can lead to a, a spontaneous brain injury. Is that clear? Okay, that's great. So, before we go into detail, I need to discuss the anatomy of the, uh, uh, the coverage of the brain with you. So firstly, this is the brain tissue right here. That's the brain tissue. Okay. So let me change the color for you. So inside here, you this is the part of the brain tissue. The brain tissue is, uh, as I mentioned, it's like inside a box. So this is the borders of the box. This is the bone from outside. Between the bone and the brain tissue, we're going to find the three layers of meninges. These meninges are divided into three layers, which is called the tura matter from outside, arachnoid matter in the middle, and pia matter, which is very attached to the brain. So you have three layers, basically. The dura matter right here, which is attached to the bone, and the pia matter right here, attached to the brain, and then between you will find the arachnoid matter. Between these layers, we're going to find two spaces. A space below the dura matter, which is called subdural space, and a space below the arachnoid matter called the subarachnoid space. Okay? Something also I need to mention about the dura matter. Dura matter is basically formed of two layers just like this. The layer toward the meninges is called the meningeal layer, and the other layer is toward the bone is called periosteal layer. Okay? Two layers, 
meningeal layer and periosteal layer, and these two layers does not have a space between them. They are very connected together. This is a histological classification. Okay, so this is the bone, and the bone is covered from outside by something called the periosteum, which is quite similar to the structure of the periosteal layer of the dura mater. If you have two bones, the two bones will be connected together in something called a suture. So this is a bone, and that's another bone. They'll be connected together in the middle by something called bone suture, like this, just like small projections that connect the two bones together. Okay, so you have here from inside, you have the dura mater, and from outside, you have the periosteum. Those will be connected together through this suture. It will like form a very tight seal right here. So the dura mater is not like a layer like in the sky. It's not like a flying layer. It's just connected to the bone and very adherently attached to this area, which is called the suture. So if you have another suture right here, also this will be attached and this will be attached. Okay? This have some clinical significance we're going to discuss in a bit more detail later on. Okay. So after that, you'll have another uh, uh, wait for minutes you have another another uh, uh, just let me leave this for you phrasal drawings so you have the dura mater I mentioned it's a thick outer covering of the brain it's formed of two layers the periosteal and the inner meningeal layer and the periosteal layer is firmly attached to the inner side of the skull and the continuous with the periosteum from the outer, the outer surface the meningeal layer is in close contact to the arachnoid matter. So what else? So this is another diagram. You have here the skin, and that's the periosteum, and this is the bone, and below this you'll find the periosteal layer of the dura mater, meningeal layer of the dura mater, below this you'll find the subdural space, below this you'll find the arachnoid matter, and below the arachnoid matter you'll find the subarachnoid space, and after that the pia matter, which is adherent, adherently attached to the brain tissue, and after that you're gonna find the uh, uh, brain tissue itself. So you have two spaces, subarachnoid space here and subdural space here, and between the dura and the bone, there is no space. Okay? So, so everybody's following with me. If you have any questions, guys, please write these questions so I can read them. Just a second. Okay, I'm, I'm just trying to read your questions. Okay, just a second, guys. Just end of the video, because obviously some guys are complaining about that. So after that, we're going to talk about something called the epidural hematoma. So what is the epidural hematoma? It's basically a hematoma above the dura, and it's more common in young adults, and the dura simply detach from the inner side of the brain, as I mentioned in the last photograph, and it represents 1% of the head trauma. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. You have, like, as I mentioned before, if you can look at this here, you have the dura matter right here, and above this, this is the bone. What if some blood came between the bone and the dura matter? It will simply detach the dura matter from the bone and form a very large hematoma. Okay? So, simple detachment of these two together is called an epidural hematoma. After that, it happens in young adults. And the dura detaches and represent one percent of the head trauma. So in your exam, you're gonna have a question exactly like this. You have a very young patient, like 16 year old or 27 year old, any age between one year old and 40 years old, is presented to you after a local head trauma with disturbed conscious level, and then the patient wakes up again, and then the patient disturbs again. Okay? So we're gonna talk about this in a bit more detail in a second. So, that's epidural hematoma. After this, the source of the bleeding, for anything you have 
either arterial source of the bleeding or venous source of the bleeding. So this dura, as I mentioned, uh, it, below the bone, between the, it and the bone, there is something called uh, uh, the dural sinuses. Right here, we're going to find something in blue. This is a dural sinuses, okay? It's superior sagittal sinus to be more exact. So this might be a source of the bleeding. Also below this, you're going to find uh, some blood vessels that pierces the dura to enter and sub to enter the, to the brain tissue and supply the outer coverage of the brain. It's called the metameningeal artery. The metameningeal artery passes to the brain from foramen spinosum. Okay, passes the brain from foramen spinosum and pierces the dura to cover to supply the outer coverage of the brain tissue. So those could be the source of the bleeding and epidural hematoma. So here you have an arterial source of the bleeding right here. It could be the metameningeal artery or venous source of the bleeding could be the dural sinus or metameningeal vein. That's an important question that usually comes in the exam. So here again, that's a hematoma and right here is the metameningeal artery. So the metameningeal artery here is the source of the bleeding and you will find that the trauma between the bone from outside, right here, and the dura matter from inside. Okay? So, the clinical presentation that usually comes, as I mentioned, you'll have a very young patient presented to you with pre post traumatic loss of consciousness, like for a few minutes or maybe hours. Okay? And then the patient has something called lucid interval, or the patient wakes up again for several hours and talks to you very normal. And then suddenly, an hour blue, the patient loses his consciousness level, his conscious level again. So this is the textbook presentation to the epidural hematoma. Also, sometimes you have headache and vomiting and seizures like anything else that could affect the brain. Sometimes we have contralateral hemibarises, but this is not a usual presentation in epidural hematoma unless the hematoma itself is above the motor area. Okay? Okay. So basically, you have the textbook presentation right here, brief post-traumatic loss of consciousness, lucid interval, and then loss of consciousness again. This is a typical question in blood one exam. How to diagnose? Like any diagnosis that we know about, firstly, you discuss with the patient the clinical presentation, and then uh, you take the history from the patient, and then you do your examination, you will find the textbook presentation, brief post-traumatic loss of consciousness, and then you're going to find uh, uh, the patient wakes up again in lucid interval and then loses of consciousness, conscious level again. You will order a CT scan for the patient. And CT scan is the gold standard for your diagnosis. Okay? You will find something called biconvex hematoma. The hematoma is convex. So if you look at this picture here, this is a CT brain at this level, at the Selvian fissure level right here, you will find that. There is something that looks really weird and different from the brain tissue right here. And this something is convex towards the brain tissue and convex toward the skull tissue. Okay, so this is biconvex hematoma. So as I mentioned before, right here is a suture and right here is a suture and the dura is attached to this suture through this way and the trauma happened here. So you have some blood right here and it gives you a biconvex or a lens-like uh, uh, hematoma. So this is an epidural hematoma, very straightforward. Biconvex hematoma, limited by the skull suture because, as I mentioned, periosteal layer is continuous with the periosteum from outside. And also, you might find some midline shift. In this picture, the midline shift, you drew a line through this area, but here, I don't find a midline shift at all. You have here, epidural hematoma with no midline shift, but it's a very big hematoma. That's another picture for you. Also here you find a suture, and right here you find a suture, and this is the dura matter attached to the two sutures, and also you have here the hematoma, which is called epidural hematoma. Also that's another picture for you, but this shows if you look here, this is the midline, and if you draw an imaginary line between those two parts, the center of the brain, or the center of the skull, bone, from the cresta galley in, uh, uh, on both sides, you find that the midline is quietly shift. This is a lateral ventricle, and it's shift to the left side. So this is an epidural hematoma. Okay? Great. Uh, are you following with me, guys? 
try to read your questions before we move on to the next topic. I can't read the question, but just give me a second. Please help, I can see someone talking, okay? But that was really old. So, great. Uh, let's move on to the next part. So we talked about the epidural hematoma. I'll give you a high yield slide. Now before that, the, the management of the high of the epidural hematoma is basically, your job is just to call the neurosurgeon just to decide if it's gonna operate or not. But just for your record, the operation comes if the hematoma is really big, and the three pictures that we mentioned earlier, that you've seen earlier, were really huge hematoma that needs to be evacuated. So somebody asked, please tell the difference again. Uh, what is the... Um... Okay, so the first question mentioned that where is the temporal bone in proximity to metameningeal artery? Basically, the metameningeal artery passes from the anterior border of the uh, uh, temporal bone from foramen spinosum from the base of the skull. Okay, that's that's a good question. Thank you. Difference again, I don't follow. If you can specify the question just to be able to answer it. Okay, so the initial management, okay, for this patient, your job is to deal with this patient as a polytrauma patient following the A, B, C, D, E approach, and we might discuss it in another setting the airway, breathing, and circulation, and then, then uh, the, the uh, D for uh, disorder or, uh, or the GCS and the uh, 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 pupillary reaction, just to manage the patient basically, the vital signs, and then your job is to transfer the patient to neurosurgery department. Your job is to admit the patient to the neurosurgery department for further development. And also, if you admit the patient under observation, sometimes we observe the patient if the hematoma was really small, like uh, if it's less than one and a half centimeter uh, width, we just observe the patient and we do uh, a CT every six hours. But this is the job of the neurosurgeon. It's not the job of a general medicine or uh, a hematoma. So the medical management, which is not very likely in an in, in epidural hematoma, if the thickness is less than one point centimeter, if the volume is, is less than 30 cc, if the midline shift is less than 0.5 centimeter, GCS is more than eight, and the serial CT scan of the patient is stable. But this is not your job again. That's the job of the neurosurgeon. Okay? You'll find the complete opposite here in the surgical management. To your knowledge, you just need that to know that the uh, your, your, you will do the primary management for the epidural hematoma patient, the initial management, and then you refer the patient to the neurosurgeon to uh, complete it. So the high yield epidural hematoma is usually happen in young adult after head trauma, presented to you with loss of consciousness, the lucid interval, metamenzial artery, the common source, and it passes through the foramen spinosum, and CT will show the biconvex hyperdense hematoma and needs urgent surgical evacuation in most of the cases, and craniotomy, okay? Great, so uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is the subdural hematoma. If you remember, as I mentioned earlier, we have three layers of the uh, three layers of the meninges. So, so, for example, this is the dura, and right here, this is the arachnoid matter, and right here, this is the bia matter. You have a space here; it's called subdural space, and you have a space here that's called subarachnoid space. So now we are concerned about this space, the subdural space. Sometimes we have uh, 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 some blood in this area, either due to a trauma or spontaneous, okay? So here, firstly, the subdural hematoma. So it's a hematoma in the subdural space, the space below the, the dura matter, okay? Uh, the classification of subdural hematoma is basically for your exam, it's acute and chronic, but I just added subacute because it's so easy. The acute hematoma, acute subdural hematoma, 
when the hematoma happens in less than three days, okay? The chronic hematoma, chronic subdural hematoma, when the hematoma happens in more than three weeks. So three days and three weeks. Among them, it's subacute hematoma. And also, there is the, this classification depends upon the uh, CT diagnosis, okay? The CD, if the hematoma is hyperdense, hyperdense means it's so white like the bone, so this is acute hematoma. If it's isodense, like the brain tissue, it's subacute hematoma. If it's hypodense, black like the CSF, so this is chronic hematoma, okay? What are the causes of the hematoma? So, uh, firstly, it's head trauma, but might be severe enough to cause cortical laceration, laceration to the cortex to the brain. So, this will lead to subdural hematoma. But sometimes you have a very old patient, like it, the, 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 the exam will be like this. You have a 65-year-old patient presented to you with a disturbed conscious, uh, 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 conscious level. This patient lives alone and is hypertensive and has high, high, high level of cholesterol. The patient is taking aspirin, colobidogrel, and warfarin. And he drinks like two uh, cups of alcohol a, a day, for example. So this patient has certain risk factors and he lives alone. This might have spot in your mind that this patient might have multiple frequent trauma when he's living alone. Okay, uh, so uh, right here, I mentioned the patient is really old and alcoholic and using anticoagulant like aspirin or colobidogrel or warfarin, for example, and having multiple frequent trauma. So this will be the scenario in the exam. So you have two different presentation. An acute subdural hematoma usually comes after an accident and then quite younger patient it's severe head injury. Neurological state of the patient or the conscious level is not improving at all, or the patient is deteriorating. So this is acute subdural hematoma. On the other side, you have a chronic subdural hematoma. It's a very old patient with one or more of the risk factors, which is hypertension, taking anticoagulant or bleeding disorder, or having a tumor, for example, presented to you after multiple small trivial traumas with headache, for example or stroke-like symptoms, like mouth deviation, weakness on one side of the lamps, and, and like uh, dysarthria, for example, okay? So this is chronic hematoma. And the timing plays the vital issue. Acute is less than three days, chronic is more than three weeks. Okay. So the di diagnosis, once again, you should consider taking the history and talk about the predisposing factors and do the initial assessment and examination for the patient. CT scan is the gold standard of diagnosis. You will find a hypodense hematoma, hypodense hematoma in chronic subdural, hyperdense hematoma in acute subdural because this is blood and this is like libu, uh, 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 yeah, it was a blood that was like has, something happened that's called liposuction or 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 something like um breaking of the, of the rbcs and breaking of the lipid inside the uh, blood itself so it will turn into hypodense isodense is in subacute hematoma okay i mentioned before that the epidural hematoma does not cross the suture lines because the dura is attached but right here the arachnoid matter is not attached to, to any of the uh, skull sutures so it might cross the suture lines. So if you look at this picture, you will find something is strange right here, and its color, it's close to the bone. So this is hyperdense. And it's also not biconvex, but crescentic-like. It's like a crescent, for example. And here you will find a suture line, and here a suture line, and it easily crosses a suture line. So this is subdural hematoma. So is it acute or chronic? So this is hyperdense, so that's acute subdural hematoma. And if you look right here, you'll find some midline shift, okay? The ventricles are shifted right here. So this is significant acute subdural hematoma that needs urgent surgical evacuation. So let's look at this picture. You find right here that something is strange right here. And its color is quite similar to the CSF in the ventricles. So this is, sub this is chronic subdural hematoma. Also, you might find a midline shift. So what is the story of this patient? This patient will be a very old patient taking anticoagulant like aspirin or clobidogrel or warfarin or apexaban, for example, presented to you with disturbed conscious level and headache. 
okay? What is the presentation of this patient? A young patient presented to you after significant heat trauma and the neurological state of this patient is not improving at all. So this is acute subdural, that's a chronic subdural. What is the management? Or this patient, the acute subdural, you need to remove this part of the bone to decrease the mass, the mass effect on the brain tissue. So we remove this part of the bone, okay? So what is the management of this area? We just do something bare hole. We remove a very small area, like maybe exactly the side of this arrow is just two centimeter. Two, we made two, one right here and one right here, and then we make a gush of fluid using a syringe of 60 centimeter to evacuate this hematoma. So the management again, craniotomy is nearly necessary to evacuate the acute subdural hematoma. Gentle irrigation through bare holes for chronic subdural hematoma. That's all you need to know. Okay. Okay. So do you have any questions till now? I will read your questions right now. Okay, how can I get this? Okay, so do we need to remember these values? Yeah, no, you don't need to remember the values of epidural hematoma. This is basically for a neurosurgeon. When do we use mannitol? Okay, look, ma'am, uh, I'm sorry. Look, you, we, we use mannitol in any patient with a mass effect in the brain. Any patient with a mass effect, this is a general rule for you. We use mannitol if we have any patient with a mass effect in the brain, we use mannitol because this is a dehydrating agent. If you have a tumor inside the brain, you might use mannitol. If you have a subarachnoid, a subdural hematoma, you might use mannitol if it's a chronic subdural, not acute subdural, because acute subdural is surgical management. We might use an epidural hematoma. No, that's absolutely wrong. Because if you use mannitol in epidural hematoma, it will significantly increase the size of hematoma. If you think about it, mannitol decreases the size of the brain tissue. <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. Decreasing the size of the brain tissue will significantly create a negative pressure and increase the epidural hematoma. So we, we basically use mannitol if the trauma or the hematoma is inside the brain, but not outside the brain. Okay? Okay. So let's move on. We have right here something called subarachnoid. So once again, I talked about three layers. The dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. Right here, you have the subdural space. Right here, you have the subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space contains the CSF and also contains the circle of, we of Willis or the circle of wells, which supplies the brain tissue with the blood. Okay? Sometimes we have blood in this area. So it's called subarachnoid hematoma. So subarachnoid hematoma is basically sub a, 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 a hematoma in the subarachnoid space. Okay? Uh, between the sub, uh, the, the, the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. This is space contained the CSF, and this is very important information. And the main arteries uh, and circle of wells lie in this space. Great. Next, uh, causes, usually the trauma is the commonest cause of subarachnoid hematoma. The patient sustained the trauma, he might get epidural or subdural or subarachnoid hematoma. Also, a very aneurysm. Aneurysm is a dilatation of the blood vessel due to weakness in the media part of the histology of the wall of the blood vessel. Sometimes you have arterial venous malformation or a bleeding from tumors or a bleeding disorder or, 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 or maybe associated factors with the aneurysm like hypertension, irritable cystic kidney disease, alcohol, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So again, what is the story right here? You will have a patient usually a female, an old patient, she's hypertensive and she's drinking alcohol and she have a history of, of renal disease, polycystic kidney disease, for example, presented to you with the worst headache of her life. This is the worst headache. So basically this headache is the worst for the patient and the worst for, for the doctor as well. So the clinical presentation, this is a textbook presentation, thunderclap headache, which is the worst headache of my life. Okay, and referred for the doctor as sentinel headache because 
this is the worst alarm that can a doctor get. It's an alarm for you that, that you should hurry up. This patient is has like a, like a palm in his brain that might lead to significant bleeding later on. So you need to act upon very fast and correctly. No, sorry. So right here, this is the clinical presentation. It's headache, thunderclap headache, the worst headache of your life. And for the doctor, it's sentinel headache or the headache that you can know the diagnosis from. Okay. Also, you might have anything in the subarachnoid space might lead to irritation to the meninges and the brain tissue. It will create something called meningism. It's like meningitis-like symptoms, headache, fever, photophobia, vomiting, projectile vomiting, and neck stiffness sometimes. And also focal neurological signs if it's present on certain areas of the brain. What's your, uh, how can you ignore this? So basically the diagnosis is made upon the history, the clinical presentation, the worst headache of my life doctor, and the initial evaluation of this patient. We'll find some of the risk factors like hypertension, atherosclerosis, or kidney disease, or alcohol drinking, or Ehlers Danlos syndrome, for example. <clears throat> Sorry. You will make a CT scan for this patient, which is the best initial investigation. You will do a lumbar puncture as well. If the CT scan is not diagnostic, you will do a lumbar puncture, and it will show something called xanthochromia. Okay, it's usually 12 hours from the time. Why there is something called xanthochromia? Due to after 12 hours, there is separation between the plasma tissue and the, 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 the RBCs and white blood cells. So the plasma usually change the color to yellow. Okay, so it's xanthochromia. CT Andrew is a com best confirmatory test. So you need to familiarize yourself with two things the initial invest investigation and the confirmatory test. Best initial investigation is CT, best confirmatory test is CT Andrew. Okay. What's the treatment? Nemirubine is a drug, is a calcium channel blocker that's used usually in any bleeding in subarachnoid space to decrease a phenomena called vasospasm. Okay? Ruptured aneurysm needs something called endovascular clipping or coiling, and this is done by a neurosurgeon. So basically, you will do your initial evaluation and inform your senior or talk to a neurosurgeon to come and visit the patient immediately. This is a CT. You will find some hemorrhage in the subarachnoid space. This is called sylvian fissure, and these are basic cisterns of the brain. And also here, these are gyruses or gyri, okay, gyri. You'll find the blood in this area, so that's subarachnoid hemorrhage. That's another picture to subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, before we move on to the questions, is there anybody here have any questions at all? Please write it in the question part. If you have any questions, please write it. Okay. Before we move and solve our questions today, I need to give you a very fast, uh, like, uh, view or review on the three basic traumas or the three basic hematomas. The type of the brain injury or epidural hematoma usually associated with the metamenangial artery. It happens in young adults on the side of the brain. There is increased intracranial pressure, immediate loss of consciousness, and then you will have lucid interval, and then decline of mental function of the brain. Okay. So again, epidural scar fractures, metamenangial artery, happens on younger fleet, and increased intracranial pressure, immediate loss of consciousness, it recovers spontaneously by lucid interval, and then decline in mental function again. So lucid interval, the patient has uh, his full consciousness again. You'll make a CT, you'll find a biconvex hyperdense. Your job is to refer to a neurosurgeon. <clears throat> Sorry. For subdural, it might be chronic. Maybe basically it's a three weeks, having an elderly, an anticoagulant, high INR, an alcoholic, minor falls, minor head injury, bridging veins, and it's a slow onset and symptoms of progressive headache, confusion, and vomiting, and gradually. So guys, this is our notes. This will be your main source of studying, okay? That was just to explain to you everything and to be easy, to make this easy to study. Here in acute, you don't find this in interval at all. The patient is barely awake. The GCS score of the patient is ex extremely low. It's significant hematoma, low GCS, increased intracranial pressure and confusion, CT crescent-shaped hyperdense hematoma, surgical evacuation, 
and mannitol could be given to decrease intracranial pressure. Mannitol is not used in in in, in uh, epidural hematoma, and we might correct this later on. Mannitol is not usually used in epidural hematoma. Okay, because as I mentioned, it will create negative pressure and decrease the side of the hematoma. Subarachnoid hematoma is aneurysm formation or trauma is the commonest uh, 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 reason, and sometimes aneurysm, spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage, sudden onset, ruptured cerebral aneurysm. The patient presented to you by thunderclap headache, the worst headache of my life, and usually excipital. The patient might be might be having polycystic kidney disease of adult type, hypertension, alcohol consumption and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, first headache in a long time, person who does not usually suffer from headache, uh, mental irritation, as I mentioned, anything in subarachnoid space can cause mental irritation, even bacteria can cause that, CT was gone without contrast is the best initial investigation, lumbar puncture, if you can't find anything in the CT, and later on you want to do CT and you to make exact diagnosis, this is the best confirmatory test. So now guys, I have a few questions for you, just to train yourself and familiarize yourself for the exam. And these questions that came before in the exam. So look at this CT, you find something here. Please guys, if you have any questions, write them and I'm gonna read them, all of them. So this, this CT scan, you find something weird here, something very shiny like the boom, okay? And it's convex toward the brain. So th this should enlighten something in, 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 or spot something in your brain. So let's read that. 40 year, a young, old man and is usually a man presented to you drinking with friends involved in a car accident significant hematoma the patient is sleepy and the trauma bay and the ct is demonstrated below so this is the ct it's very straightforward if you can share the answer with me i would love that but this is basically an epidural hematoma okay there is a question that's a great it's c Great. Uh, okay, next question. The same patient, the same patient, 40 year old, out drinking with friends, involved in a car accident, on a swing pa passenger, is a sleepy, trauma HCT demonstrated before, injured. Okay. Uh, it, the question says the injured vessel in this setting entered the skull through what foramen? So I'd like to see your answers. Foramen spinosum, that's great. Great. It's C. Also here, you have a 40-year-old man who was out drinking with friends involved in a car accident. The same, the same case. What is the next step of management? Your answers. Your answers, guys. Okay. Somebody said D. Some two said C. D. Okay. So guys, just to make this clear for you, uh, epidural hematoma is never a bare hole, is never a bare hole drainage. A bare hole drainage is basically for chronic subdural hematoma. It's never for anything of acute setting, okay? You might do a bit side if you don't have like an access to an operating theater, but if you have operating theater, so the answer is basically C, it's operative evacuation if you are in a neurosurgery setting. So the right answer is C, okay? I don't know any confusion about that. Just write this in your notes. Bare hole is never a management to any acute setting. It's always a management for chronic subdural hematoma, okay? So what about this? You have something weird here and the crescentic in shape with midline shift and it's a color is exactly like bone. So you're evaluating an 82, 82 significantly old patient who takes aspirin, the patient takes aspirin, aspirin for coronary artery disease, presented to emergency department with a head CT, with a headache and sleepiness. CT is shown below. What is the most likely diagnosis? The CT again. These are your answers. B, B, okay. Subdural B, okay, that's a great. So the answer is subdural hematoma. The same question, how long has this bleeding likely been present? The same patient, the same patient. How long? Your answers, guys, please.
Okay, great, A, 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 great, 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 great. Great, great. So if you look at this patient at the CT, it's hyper dense. That means it's acute subdural hematoma. Okay, it's exactly like Boone, if you can see that. So it's basically from one to three days. One to three days, the answer is A. Question three, same patient. The GCS of this patient is 15 and neurologically intact, does not have any anything, just complaining of headache and having the same at all. What will be your management for this patient? Yeah, I need some answers. It's acute. So just to fill this again, bear hole is never a management for any acute setting. Bear hole is never a management for any acute setting. Okay. Admission and observation, less likely. Anyone, anyone has the answer? B, that's correct. That's not correct. B is not correct. C, okay. That needs decompressive hemicraniotomy. Decompressive hemicraniotomy. Okay. So the right answer is C in this patient. So once again, acute subdural hematoma is never a conservative management. Acute subdural hematoma is never a conservative management. It's always a surgical management. Okay, because the patient, if he has a small subdural hematoma, acute subdural hematoma, he might uh, 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 deteriorate at any moment. So somebody answered A, and that's quite interesting. EVD insertion, extraventricular drain insertion, we usually don't use extraventricular drain in acute subdural hematoma. This is basically used for patients with hydrocephalus mostly. If you need to use something new in subdural hematoma, that's, that's something else we might talk about it later, but it's something called subdural drain, not epidural insertion. So again, just not to get lost, we're in lab one exam, just a very simple questions. Decompressive hemicraniotomy is the right answer. The right answer is C. Okay, so this question, a 55-year-old female, 55, female, to your clinic by sudden headache that thought she has never had such headache before. She has never had such headache before. She's fully conscious, kept closing her eyes. Lovely. Kept closing her eyes, that's photophobia. And then the doctor offered a dimming of light. CT scan was offered, was ordered, and it's shown below. That's your CT scan. So what do you think is the diagnosis? I will leave the CT scan is here and you have just three options to choose from. Subarachnoid, that's a great subarachnoid. Great, so this is the right answer. So thank you guys for your understanding and listening to my webinar. So is there anybody have any questions at all? Okay, that's great. So before we move on, these are our notes that we'll be using the, during the whole course. And it's a lovely notes that's well written and they're very directed to the lab one exam. And once again, this is our package. It's a full course for six weeks, four to five hours uh, 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 as one session and two sessions a week, each session for four to five hours. The course will be 100% online and notes will be included in the course. And you will have one mock at the end and we will have discussion sessions just like this and we might improve this later on. We'll give you a study plan and there will be a WhatsApp group just to uh, like provide you with further information and further questions for the lab one exam. Okay. Um, well, well. Okay. Uh, somebody said the notes uh, say bear hole over terium. We might need to correct this. To be honest. Uh, um, bear holes is not an answer for epidural hematoma. Okay. Uh, okay, that's great. So uh, the fees of the course is basically 200, and if you are in a group, you have uh, you will just pay. You will have a 50 pound discount, and you have just to pay 150 uh, per each. So uh, if you guys have any questions, your questions are really welcomed. Any questions at all? Okay, 
So see you guys later on. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Bye bye all. Have a good day and study well for the Lab One exam.